Welcome to Wealthy On. I'm your host, Eric Chemi. We are here for our weekly market recap, and I'm joined by my good friend, Pete Nigerian. Pete, so much happened this week. I, I think about the Bitcoin ETF coming on board is certainly a big news event that happened, but we saw comments from Jamie Dimon, for example, at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference talking about the uncertainties in the economy right now, wondering about how hard or soft this landing is going to be and, and referencing those COVID payments they're going to stop coming and we're going to start seeing a lot of, of issues with people's pocketbooks. And then we saw a lot of layoffs from the most, you know, the most valuable companies in the world, like the Magnificent Seven, they're laying people off. So if the, the richest companies are laying people off. What does that mean for everybody else? So Pete, thank you so much for joining me here and sharing your thoughts today. Absolutely. I, I'm excited about it. It's always fun to be with you. You do such a great job. And, uh, it, it, it's an interesting market. It always is an interesting market to me. Uh, I dig deep into it, but to your to your point, there's a lot of news stories out there. And this week we were filled with uh, multiple of stories that really kicked it off on Wednesday. It added to it on Thursday, and then we come back to Friday, and and it's and we start earnings. So it's uh, it is a busy week. What stood out to you the most in in terms of this is going to have ramifications for the whole year? Because, you know, there's a lot of stuff we talk about week in, week out. They just don't matter the next week or the next month, but then little things that we don't pick up on that become the major trend for the year. Yeah, I, I think this was a big deal for Bitcoin, quite frankly. I mean, I, that one stands out. It was one of the early ones. And there was all that that craziness that was going on where the SEC got hacked and all this other storylines. I mean, th this, this has been a very interesting journey for Bitcoin, the ETF and the creation of that. And once we finally actually saw uh, the fact that that Gary Gensler and the, the group, disp by the way, they did not endorse this in any kind of a big way. Or, I mean, it's absolutely amazing what he said. He basically said, look, still don't believe. I mean, I'm just paraphrasing, but right. we still don't really believe in this whole thing. But yeah, we're going to grant the ETF out there to these 11. <laughs> it's well, like if, if, if you're a sucker and wants to do this, go ahead and do it. Like, I'm not going to stop you, but good luck to you. Like, it, it felt like that kind of vibe. That's exactly. That was the vibe. Uh, but there was huge movement, not just in Bitcoin. Bitcoin had a big move going into it. And then obviously this big jump up to 49,000, then it pulled back. But outside of Bitcoin, it also is affecting the miners and the transactional, t the Coinbase of the world and Marathon and all those various names. They had great runs, but the, the the volatility of those runs, Eric, is absolutely incredible, to be honest with you. I, I I look at some of those names, for instance, on the day that it was approved, they were up 10, 12 percent. And all of a sudden, within an hour or less, they're down 12 or 15 percent. I mean, the movements in Riot and some of these other names, Marathon, and suddenly in my world, the options world, the derivatives world, we started seeing a completely different uh, approach where we'd been seeing call buying going into this whole thing. And then once we got that release, suddenly we started to see the puts getting bought. And puts, for the people who don't know, calls are looking for the upside if you're buying them. And puts are going to the downside if you're buying those. And they were buying puts and they are continuing to buy puts here late into Friday. So a lot going on there. And I would tell you this, semiconductors are a very big piece to a lot of these various things, whether it's AI or whatever. I mean, there is, there's a lot of different uh, areas and verticals that get affected by Bitcoin and, and that world of this, the whole crypto world. You know, looking at the charts, right? We had the, the first week of the year, when you look at the major equities, right? S&P, NASDAQ, we saw that immediate downturn, right? The second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, come right back up Monday. And then we've stayed up higher this week. So we're sort of now positive on the year. Yep. What, what do you make of that? What do you make of that first week sharp jitter and then the immediate bounce back here in week two? Yeah, I would uh, attribute the first week to tax reasons. Uh, you know, those that want to push it out to 2024, all those great gains, not just the Magnificent Seven, but, you know, I, I actually get a little tired of everybody saying they are what really did the markets to the upside. They were, there's no doubt, but. There was plenty of others, Eric, that absolutely skyrocketed, especially if you look at the fourth quarter and the movement that we had seen there. And whether it's, you know, the financials, a name like I'll just throw out a name like Citigroup that, you know, at the end of October was 38 bucks. And by the end of the year, it was 53 bucks. So, you know, there was a lot going on. And as a matter of fact, on the financial side, which obviously this week is that's another piece to this puzzle. But, uh, you know, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, all those names 
we're flirting with all time highs, either there or very, very close. So there's a lot going on, I think, in the market outside of just the seven stocks that everybody always likes to talk about, including myself. I talk about those names a lot, but there are others out there too. Housing, you know, you, you take a look at Lennar, you take a look at that space, and it's amazing what, what has happened there and, and the rise we've seen out of those names as well. And you can go across a myriad of different other areas as well. But the start of the week, a lot of people wanted to take a lot of those big profits that they had. They wanted to push those out. So we saw a lot of selling early. And then this week, a little bit of a turnaround. And I think part of that turnaround, a big, big portion of it has to do with the treasuries. And obviously looking ahead, everybody's always talking about the Fed. I don't think I've ever been in the market where I've had the Fed be that much of the influencer that they are right now. And I've been in the market since 1992. And I can tell you, it, it just gets a, lo a lot more every single year where the Fed is really the, the ax, so to speak. And, and when you look at what the Fed's doing and, and some of the speculation that's out there and everything, when you see the 10 year start slipping underneath 4%, that tends to be a good thing for the NASDAQ stocks because risk is back on. We start getting back over 4% significantly, not just a little bit, I'm talking about more significantly, and then we see some of that selling. So I think that's a big part of it as well, Eric. And, and people are staring at a lot of different things. It's it's less about crude and gold and those kinds of things. It's, it's definitely more about what's the Fed going to do, how many cuts are they going to have, and, and all those questions that are asked every day. Who do you think on that Fed decision. Who do you think's got the best insight, the best data? Is there a Fed follower that you think is more just clued into their mentality more than anyone else? Um, I don't know that I, I could give you a great answer to that, but I, I would just say this, that you know when I look at the Fed and we look at the Fed tool, I always like to look at, put money where your mouth is, right? And, and I look at the Fed tool, for instance, over at the CME, and I, I watch that thing very closely and try to, you know, the speculation that goes out in time as well. It's really interesting. It's very, it's been very accurate. That's given us a lot of, of really what's happened, I think, within the markets and what the Fed decisions end up being. And we watch those kind of gyrate around a little bit, but it has come down to some degree. I, you know, I think we were significantly higher that, hey, in March, we were going to get a cut. Well, we still are there, but it's it's lower. It's come down to about a 70% chance as opposed to, let's say, a 78 or an 80% chance. So I think there is a lot of movement and shifting going around. I still don't know this one. Maybe you could answer this one for me. How can they say that they expect six cuts this coming year if they have to wait for the data, which is what the Fed does, supposedly, and I agree, I think they actually do, but if they've got to wait for the data, how can they possibly forecast that out that far? I, I don't understand that at all. So uh, I just keep my head down and focused and looking at everything that I can and every, all the different things, whether it's this week, by the way, we've had CPI, we've had the PPI numbers. So one's a little bit hot, one's a little bit cold. I mean, it, it really is interesting to see what's going on in the markets right now and this week. It is a good point, right? It's like they anchor themselves psychologically to here's a path, mm -hmm. but you don't have the data yet. So you're assuming a certain path of data to give yourself that decision, you know, that decision framework. But now if the data doesn't conform to what you thought. Yeah. How much are you going to ignore it? Oh, that's an, you know, transitory. That's an outlier. That's an exception. Or, you know, we're going to deduct this and add that and adjust this because because is it more important that you wait for the data or is it more important that you stick to what you said you were going to do? So I, I do think that that creates a lot of confusion. And we've had people say, look, I wish they said less. I wish they didn't have all these press conferences and speaking engagements. And I wish they didn't put these predictions out there because it, it causes more uncertainty, it causes more volatility, and it causes more of a pullback, right? People say, I don't know if I want to spend, I don't know if I want to invest because I don't know what they're going to do. Right. Yeah. No, you're you're right. And I and I remember that early on when we first started this, you were you were talking about some of the layoffs. Um, that has been something that I think has to be looked at very, very closely for anybody investing in these markets when you start seeing the huge amounts because it was so much growth in terms of hiring that was going on pandemic time. And now all of a sudden we're starting to see that, all right, we, we don't need this many employees. We're getting rid of 6% over at Google. We're getting rid of some at Meta. We're getting rid of some. 
it's uh, th those numbers become very large numbers because we're talking about an incredibly high number of employees in a lot of these various firms on the tech side that that they had to build it up. But now they're coming back down because they need the efficiencies. And, and that's what they're doing. And that's going to be affecting a lot about what the Fed does, of course, because, you know, that that puts a lot more folks in a, in a position where it becomes a little bit more difficult to navigate, you know, economically, especially if food and energy stay up as much as they have um, against the rest of what's getting measured when we're talking about inflation. Yeah, like, you know, you mentioned inflation in the Fed, and I'm, I'm looking at a headline here from, from Friday, Friday morning. Wholesale prices, like you said, the numbers come out, wholesale prices unexpectedly fell mm -hmm. one-tenth of one percent, right? 0.1% in December mm -hmm. in a positive inflation sign. Now, I think the last few words, is it really a positive inflation sign or is this a weak consumer sign, right? Is this a price are coming down because people can't afford to buy, right? Yeah. It's, is this good or bad, right? So that that's like, well, what do you take when you look at data like that? What's your perspective on it? How should we understand it? I think we just have to be uh, very um, real about how we look at all these things. You know, we, when you go to the gas station and you look and you see what the price is now versus what it was maybe a year ago. And when you go to the grocery store and you see the price of eggs continues to be something extremely high. Right. And and meat continues to be something that is projected to stay fairly high. There's a lot going out there, Eric. I, you know, I, it, it's not easy, of course, to try to try to figure out exactly what the directions are going to be for any of these things. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different things that could trigger crude and, and the price of oil and the price of gas. Uh, Nat gas has made a pretty sig significant run so far early here in 2024. We're looking at Nat gas that was sitting, you know, it was in the middle twos. And now here we are getting up towards three and a quarter. So there's there is a lot going on behind the scenes. I don't know if everybody always is keeping an eye on you know, all these various uh, levels and so forth, but um, I don't think it makes it easy for folks. And I think from uh, from the standpoint of the the, the consumer, how about the, the the thought and City brought this up on their earnings on Friday, just talking about credit card debt, and it's something we've been talking about for a very long time. And it just seems to go past people. When you look at how much debt is there on credit card debt, it's a scary number. We're talking about plus trillions. So, uh, you know, when we look at that, we look at the government, we look at all these various numbers and, and the debt levels that we are at right now. Um, that is something I think you should always have, you know, somewhere in your thoughts as you're as you're navigating in these markets, because that certainly is something that's going to be a factor. It hasn't really been as major a factor yet. But I think it's bubbling a little bit right now, Eric. Why do you think people, it's going over their heads? Why are they not getting these major points here? You know, that's a great question that I, I couldn't give you a great answer other than, you know, there are there are folks out there that as long as they can continue on what they're doing, which is, you know, the debt levels keep going a little bit higher and a little bit higher, not able to pay all, all this off. And then those incredible, you know, percentages you're going to have to pay on that. At some point, that doesn't end well. And, and I don't know when that point is reached, but I thought it would have been reached last year to some degree. It didn't. Uh, and it's something that I think we do have to continue just to have that, at least in the back of our minds, that that is an issue. And and they the consumer might be strong, but why are they strong? How are they strong? And you know, we, we look at housing prices and we look at all those types of things and we have seen mortgage rates come down. That's been something good. We're seeing some of the prices for homes going back up. That's been something very good. But, uh, you know, when you look at a lot of the different debts that are out there, whether it's college debt or whatever, uh, it, it, these numbers are extraordinary. How should people, you know, position themselves around that though, right? Because these numbers have been bad and they've been bad for a while, but markets are shrugging them off. And if you, if you stay too, how do you say if you stay too narrowly focused on the bad numbers, you're missing out on a lot of right. gains out there. So it can get very confusing for people like, hey, I'm trying to watch these macro fundamentals. I'm trying mm -hmm. to do the right thing, but I'm going to get crushed against my benchmark here. I'm just going to not make any money if, if I if I don't just go with the herd at some point. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of why I think that, you know, John and I um, have always been guys that are very focused on specific names 
very less about the big ETFs. We do we do uh, obviously take note of them. We do trade them and and invest in some of them. But the reality is we are very focused on where we're looking, and we we base a lot of what we're doing on the unusual options that we see. And it is it's an interesting thing to to see where the big guys out there are focused and where they're kind of shifting. And it, you know, it was again, technology that was where everybody was focusing. And then all of a sudden it shifted late in the year, all of a sudden financials started to get that little bit of a hit to the upside as well. And then you start seeing other areas in the market and this rotation. So anytime you see the healthy rotation, that's a good thing. Um, I just think that it's important to have it, Eric, in the back of your mind that you know Hey, there is a lot of debt out there. It's something we got. We should we should be conscious of. Um, hopefully, it's not with you or with me. Uh, but in, in any regard, it it's somewhere out there, and it's something we have to keep an eye on. But you can't just have that as your only focus. You've still got to focus on the specific companies, what they're doing, how they're doing it, and how are they executing as they're doing this. And you know, I think that's where a lot of these technology names, and it's why they've done the right thing. Probably they did all that hiring. Now they're doing some of the firing, but it's because they're being disciplined. They're being disciplined because they know exactly where they need to be and they need to be as efficient as humanly possible and, and still be able to hit some of these numbers. And so it, it's one of those things that I, 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 people always think I'm just a bullish guy, right? They always say, oh, well, you're just a perma bull. All you ever do is talk about positive things. And when I do talk about those kind of things, which is, d- d- does happen a fair amount, but when I do talk about that, it's because in my world, the derivatives world, it's much easier to understand why somebody might be buying call options as opposed to buying put options, because there are so few shorts out there. Now, there are some massive, you know, obviously groups that are, they're short. That's exactly what they do. They short stocks all over the place. But Compared to the longs, it's not even close. So I'm oftentimes watching the, the incredible activity that we are seeing in specific names. It could be an NVIDIA, it could be Tesla, whatever the name might be. And we see this gigantic call buying, you know, two months out and, you know, $20 higher. That's something that's going to be in my, my brain and I'm going to look at it. I might execute on it myself. And if so, um, I am looking to the upside and it's not necessarily mm-hmm. just because I'm bullish, but I look at the fundamentals, I look at the backdrop and then I, I look at the company themselves and say, you know what, this actually makes a heck of a lot of sense. And it, and it could be in NVIDIA, it could be in, you know, Micron, it could be in any of these stocks that we talk about all the time. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just all part of how you got to parse through things and try to have your own lane and your focus on what are you looking at? And I don't get caught up in all the negativity, though. I I just have to know that it's there and understand that that debt at some point in time, some point in time is going to be an issue, but it isn't right now. And that's the hard part, the hard part, the hard question at some point in time, but it may not be this week, this month, this year, this decade, this lifetime, this century. We don't know. Right. You mentioned specific names. What stood out to you this week? Anything unusual options activity that is getting you on certain focus areas right now from this week? Yeah. You know, one of the things that that has stuck out for us for a little while is is just looking at an area where we're seeing a lot of acquisitions and that's in the healthcare world. And and so that's been very interesting. And we just had United Health uh, report Friday. And their numbers were pretty extraordinary, but they did talk about some of the costs that are going up against them as well. Uh, so the stock got sold off a little bit. And when I say a little bit, I mean just a little bit, because this is a stock that's made an incredible run up towards those 52-week highs, but it's given back a little bit on Friday. But when I look at what their numbers that they put up, absolutely incredible. Uh, and you know, so I look in healthcare, I see names like United Health, but as far as unusual options, we've seen a lot in the biotech space because biotechs are getting bought up, it seems like, every single day, Eric. It's absolutely incredible. And some of these numbers are are pretty massive. So that's something that's definitely caught our eye, uh, my eye uh, early on in 24, has been all of this acquisitional type thing. And that's even before the, the JP Morgan Health Conference and all the rest of that. We, we just are seeing so much, and whether it's a Merck or, or, or Novartis, or it doesn't really matter. There are so many different names out there that are approaching and, and executing on some of this that I think that's something that's going to be a theme probably this year is some of this acquisitional buyouts that uh, we're starting to see already in that area. But I think we'll start to see it in other parts of the market as well, not just the biotech 
and healthcare markets. I think we're going to start seeing that in other areas as well because the opportunities are there. And we talked about this about JP Morgan. It wasn't necessarily intentional at the time until it was, but you know, the acquisition that they made in, in the regional banking crisis, ah, that seemed like that uh, ended up doing pretty well for them from what I can see. They always seem to find a way to, to make the right, right move. Yeah. Anything, you know, now the flip side, any trades, any areas that you're sort of moving away from over the past week, anything that, you know, I just asked you, what, what are you looking at to get into? Is anything you're like, I think this move is done. I, I'm wrapping this up. You know, not not really right now. Uh, I, I haven't really seen a lot of that, quite honestly. I see a lot of protective things in ETFs that are out there, though, Eric. And that, like that what? I think, is an something... example of that. Well, so what we're seeing is our names like uh, ETF, like the IWM, for instance, and massive put buying in there, massive put buying in the SPY as well. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're negative. Those, those puts um, oftentimes, and they're oftentimes used as spreads. So they're buying one and selling the other. Um, it gives people the opportunity to, to maybe hedge. And whether it's a, a huge institution or whatever it may be, uh, if, you, if you can get that hedge to the downside and gives you a little bit of uh, an ability to feel a little bit more free about how you're playing things to the upside, you've still got that as your backstop down there. And that's, that's what we're seeing a lot of. We're seeing a lot of ETF put buying, put spread buying, and that's, that's been pretty common for a while now, especially like last year when we had that incredible run, of course, to the upside that we had uh, along the way. They're not wasting money, folks. When, when they're buying those put spreads, that's basically like buying insurance. And we all insure our cars. We all insure our houses. And so why wouldn't you insure your portfolios? And I, that's my interpretation of it is the insurance side of it, far more so than the negativity of the markets. But that's just my own speculation. But it's been right because the markets continue to go to the upside and they continue to do these kinds of trades even to the end of last year, but even at the start of this year, including on Friday itself, massive trading on the put side there. Who do you think is buying these puts? Is this, is this retail? Is this institutions? No. Who's out there looking for this insurance? Institutions. Yeah. Somebody very big. Uh, it, it could be hedge funds. Could be a lot of different folks out there. Not retail. Retail's not going to come out there and buy 70,000, 100,000 calls or puts or anything. That's, it's just massive. And, and I can add to that, it's, it, these are not you know, 10 lot at a time. These are going in and buying 40,000, come back with another 40,000, come back with another. Uh, these are big players. So whether it's institutional or hedge funds, whatever it might be, um, those are the big guys that are playing. And that's, that's what we like to follow. And if we're right on some of our speculation that, hey, they're doing this more as a as an insurance than they are as an aggressive move for downside, um, it's it's at least something else that you can put that feather in your cap as far as when you're trying to get get yourself positioned into the next week and the next month and the next three months. It makes you wonder here at the beginning of the year, for the normal people, right? It's a new year on, hey, you can fund your IRA and you can and put money in your 401k and you can, you know, like the, the new limits, you can just like start doing more stuff right here in yeah. January. And typically it means you're buying, right? You're going long, you're investing. Mm -hmm. And here we are at basically all time highs and a lot of nervousness about, do I really want to be buying these all time highs? <laughs> and now you're telling me, well, all the big guys, all the billionaires, right? The firms, <laughs> smart money, they're the buying insurance. Money. They're buying tons of puts. Yep. Doesn't make me feel good to hear that. <laughs> yeah, but you, if you look at it as what, what I was saying as insurance, um, then you should feel pretty good about your portfolio, right? I mean, because they're just trying to protect something. And, and I think that that is a big point. One thing, um, and I just took a quick glance as we're talking, but one thing that also is an area that uh, I talked about a lot last year, and uh, I'll continue to talk about it even this year because we're seeing a lot of option paper as well. But uranium is another area where you know, it's not a name everybody in the world wants to talk about because everybody wants to, you know, be green and this and that. And I, I get it all, but that doesn't keep me from seeing what I see going on in the markets, right? And I, and I see in the uranium, uranium space, I see more and more of the call buying again. And we had it last year. And if you look at certain names out there, like a Kamiko, for instance, CCJ, that was a name that absolutely took off last year, had an incredible run to the upside, and it continues to have an incredible run now. And from what we're seeing this past week, as far as the options go, they're expecting more. 
they expect this thing to continue to move to the upside. So, uh, you know, it's whether people are happy about it or not, that is the case. And I brought this up last year a fair amount of times in the last, probably the second half of the year specifically, but it just became another part of the energy world where we just saw that much more. And it was, it was large option paper. Again, it, 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 I'm not talking about somebody going in and buying 2000. I'm talking about somebody going in buying 25,000 or 5,000 at least um, options at a time. So those are the big guys. And, you know, I, I like to follow that, you know, like you said, the smart money. Um, we like to follow that smart money because it's not an option. <laughs> you have, you have to, what else stood out to you this week? What else were you surprised about in terms of whether it was news or market move, something that, that you weren't expecting? I guess I was a little bit surprised just because we just kicked off the earnings season on Friday and, and you look over and, and JP Morgan, fabulous. And you under, you can understand why. And, and the stock reacted at least early in the day, pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, City, kind of the same thing because they'd already gotten the bad news out there. They had kind of leaked all that already earlier in the week. But I'm amazed at, at, at the problems for Wells Fargo and the problems that we saw from, from Bank of America. They just, you know, you just wonder sometimes, okay, they're all, you know, the big banks, but what, why are some of them really kind of struggling, you know, trying to get to, to get anywhere close to the performances and, and, and anything close to, you know, be able to, to report, you know, on the earnings, it's just not there. And, and it's just an amazing discrepancy that we are seeing. And it's been there for a while, but that's something that stood out because, you know, we're kicking off earnings season. We're looking at all these names. I think also just the turn on Delta. Um, and I'm not saying this as a bullish or a bearish guy on, on airlines, but Delta's numbers were pretty outstanding. And uh, you would have thought that maybe the reaction would be better, but there was a little bit of clouds around the whole thing. So that kind of pulled the stock down as well. And, you know, we all know this Boeing story from the past week or so. It's just extraordinary to say the least. And that maybe is a, a factor. And the, the price of crude, maybe the concerns of the, price, the prices of crude going up, maybe as we get more deeper into 2024. Who knows? We did have a little bit of a spike uh, on Friday on, on crude back up towards 74. But we've been in this really interesting range, Eric, where I'd call it 68 to call it 74 for the price of crude. And we've just been bouncing back and forth. And it when I say that, I don't mean it's gone from 68 to 74 and there it is. I mean, it's 68 to 74, back to 70, back up to 73, back down. <laughs> it's been trading like a meme stock almost. And and that part, I think, is something that John and I have been hitting on a lot um, when we've been talking about the markets, because it it's a, you know, it's something very big. Everybody talks about it. It's international, of course. And so you're 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 looking at those numbers. And the fact that it's moving the way it is on a daily basis, um, I think that's pretty amazing as well. And it's something that that's been standing out now for the last few weeks, I'd say, not just the first two weeks of 2024, but even a little bit before that, it's just been an incredible up and down. And it's as volatile as I've ever seen crude trading. And a lot of guys could say, well, Pete, well, what about when the thing ran up to 120? Sure. But it ran up there and then it pulled back. And now here we are and we just can't, the, we are in this little trap, at least for now, if it can break through that 74, call it 75, uh, upper end, uh, yeah, maybe we get back up into the 80s. I thought, matter of fact, last time we were in the 80s, I actually was a guy who, and I'll self-admittedly say, I thought we were going to 100. We got up into the low 80s. I thought, you know what? Based on everything going on in the world, and there's a lot, uh, I just felt like, well, it made a lot of sense. You know, the cutbacks and all the rest of the things that are going on, you know, in the Middle East, and it's just an amazing time in our lives, but uh, it, it just hasn't happened. And, and I think a lot of people are puzzled by that, just be based upon a lot of the backdrop that we've got. And yet here we are at crude at 74. I, I could easily have seen it in the 100 area. You know, it brings up a good question, right? When a lot of people saw it a certain way, doesn't happen, and then people are confused by it. And we see that a lot, right? Yeah. Just different kinds of trades. Do you have a sense of advice for people when you see something like that happen? What tends to be the final result? Does it tend to be that the, that, Hey, if it's not going to click, it never clicks. Or is it though, if you stick to your guns, 
what you thought will eventually happen. You know what I mean? Like, like that oil example, we see a lot, right? What, what's typically the end result with, with that kind of confusion? Well, at, at some point, you, you kind of expect um, something to actually occur that causes it to get back to some more, more of a normalcy, I would say. I, I, I would think that if you put all the oil analysts out there at one time a couple of months back and we were you know, making that move and we were seeing the cuts and everything else, I think pretty much everybody probably would have been on the 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 not, I, I was about to say the right side of the boat, but it wouldn't have been. But on the bullish side of the boat, that hey, we are going to a hundred. This thing is, you know, it's it's ready to start running again, and it's going to be an issue, and we're all going to have to deal with that and the prices that come along with it. But the reality was, it just didn't didn't make it there. So I I think that, you know, at some point it'll get back to trading and i don't know when this comes but it'll get back to trading with with uh, a lockstep with the headlines but for right now it just is not i mean like i say these headlines every day that we get from all parts of the world uh it would make so much sense to see that we did it doesn't have to be 100 but somewhere probably in the mid 80s to low 90s would make some sense based upon everything that's going on and yet it's not there and at some point it'll get back to that type of thing. But uh, it can take a while and it can make you broke if you fight against it too much. So I try never to fight the markets. And I, I think it's advice that John gave me when I got into this business. And it's something that I've never forgotten because you could be right about every single thing, Eric. You could be right about all the different categories of the earnings and the revenue and the growth and the projections and the outlook and all the rest of this. It doesn't mean it's going to have to happen. <laughs> right. And you just have to, you know, we've always talked about you got to swallow your ego because there comes a point where you're wrong about it. And from my perspective, I like to just cut and then come back and revisit another time. Some people will try to ride it out as long as they can. But the problem with that is it might even just sort of accumulate even more losses. So a lot of the time we, you know, I like to have sort of my own way of looking at things and when I'm going to hold on and when I'm going to get rid of it. And that's based upon, hey, where are we right now? All right, I've lost X amount of money. Okay, I'm going to sell. I need to get out of this. It's I was wrong and I need to move on. And a lot of guys and gals do not want to admit they're wrong. And that's a problem. Right, if they're still in the trade, they can say, I'm still fighting. I'm in the trade. I didn't give up. I never actually quit. I'm not wrong yet. So yeah. so I appreciate So you said, so John got you into the business. So help, help the viewers understand there's the football career. There's the options career. Who's older, John or Pete? Like, you know, because because I got some. I, I have some football questions for you before we go to. I'm so offended by who's older. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. I'm asking on behalf of the new audience member who maybe said I've never heard of Pete and Jerry, and this is my first time watching. Right. Well, and a lot of people forever thought John and I were twins. Uh, the reality is, there's two brothers between us. He's the oldest. I'm the youngest. Um, I. I uh, I don't need to say my age, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> well, so I'm you're, not, you're the fourth. Yeah. I didn't realize there were two brothers in between. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, we have. We, so my my oldest brother, John, who uh, bounced around. He was, he's a brilliant guy. I don't just say that because he's my brother. Uh, he, he just absolutely one of those guys that he had that ability to to do really well in school. I, I remember he gave mom and dad every every year he would give mom and dad for Christmas his his uh, report card because he got all A's. I mean, the guy was one of these brilliant guys who just uh, always always did really really well in school and has has that good brain for a lot of different things. But John ended up playing football into college and then actually ended up with the Chicago Bears. Um, when we left Chicago Bears, he went to the Chicago Board Options Exchange. And uh, and that's where he's been uh, literally ever since. Although we stepped away from the the the, the trading floor itself, but, right, right. And then I I played uh, in the Big Ten at the University of Minnesota, and then I bounced around in the NFL. Uh, they they traded me, Eric, oftentimes for a couple boxes of socks. I was <laughs> sometimes an elbow pad, maybe, or something like that. But if you throw um, in a helmet, we'll do the deal. <laughs> yeah, like we, we're exactly. not giving away John. We're not giving away Pete that easily here. <laughs> But I even did some coaching. As a matter of fact, I was offered some jobs coaching in the NFL that uh, I turned down. I, I actually, at one point in my life, I said, you know, I'm in my mid thirties. I, I, I need to get a real job. <laughs> you know? and, and so I, I ended up uh, in my low thirties. I, I ended up at the Chicago board ops exchange myself. And 
was just going to be there a little while because I was going to go to med school and that was going to be the end of that. I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. My father's a transplant surgeon, so I wanted to get into that field. And it just was something that I liked it and I, it stuck with me and I, I started to understand it. And so that kind of built along this whole thing. And, and I've actually coached football at the XFL. I coached fo- football in college as well. Um, I got offered a job once. You'll like this one, Eric. I got jo- offered a job once coaching and playing in arena football down in Orlando, Florida. I didn't Co- take it, but it was, it was intriguing. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, I guess if you would become an orthopedic surgeon you'd be like, you can coach, you can play. And when people break their bones, you can fix them up. You too. can fix them. I mean, you get yeah. You get the quad, you know, <laughs> and then all the players have some money, you can get them in some options deals right. and take a commission. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is amazing though, uh, that, that when I go places, how many guys, um, you get connected in the in the world of football, especially the NFL. It, once you're there, the, it's it's like a big family, and everybody kind of knows somebody else from some other era, even, and and it's great. I mean, I I've been approached as recently as in the last uh, 12, 16 months on a couple of different uh, opportunities, potentially um, semi GM type roles in the NFL, which is. Kind of one of my dreams, but you know, there's, there's sometimes there's the the easy time to say yes, and sometimes it's a more difficult time. So you know, maybe someday, but it hasn't. I I haven't done it yet, but that that's something that would be somewhere in the future, maybe. But it's a lot of fun. And by the way, I I might as well go there for us. The football coaches in the NFL. Well, I was I was going to ask you. You know, you're you're stealing my question. So I, I was going to say, you know, you're reading my mind. I was going to say, okay, well, there's some openings, right? The Alabama's got an opening. The Seahawks yeah. have an opening. The New yeah. England Patriots have an opening, right? Yeah. Like, there's yeah. a, these are these are the great titans of coaching, yeah. and all of a sudden, boom! And one day they're all gone. And and I think about them almost like you think of the great investors, right? Yeah. Oh, this guy beat the market every year for twenty years. Was it luck? Was it skill? Was it their approach? And and you see that in in a Belichick or in a, in a Saban, for example, and to a slight smaller extent to you know, to Pete Carroll. So, you know, what's your perspective on how much does the coach matter? Right. Cause, and, and, and those guys in particular, cause Belichick, I don't know if he mattered, honestly, right. <laughs> he won nothing without Brady and Brady won without him. And as soon as Brady yeah. left, that team was no good. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about him and his assistants did nothing either. Yeah. I, I don't know either, but it, but it, I think it's, it's, it's something that's a great conversation just because of the fact that, you know, he, he's considered one of the greatest coaches of all time. Right. I mean, people will say that, but to your point, how did he do without uh, Tom Brady? And, and that's obviously an issue because not so good. Uh, as a matter of fact, not, not well at all. I actually, a while back, a couple of months ago, I looked back to see what the numbers were and they were not very good without Tom Brady. So you just wonder, and every time one of the assistant coaches gets a head coaching job because he must be great because he's there with Belichick and he's doing this and, and he goes somewhere with the Las Vegas Raiders or whomever, and they all come back to New England because it just didn't work. So Joe I, Judge, I, Matt Patricia, <laughs> you know, Romeo Crennel, you go back to the original uh, Charlie Weiss. Yep, um, yep. Yeah, Charlie's still getting paid by Notre Dame, I think. <laughs> they make money. They make money. Yeah. But but yeah, but like do do you see a tie-in there in terms of like what coaches do, what GMs do, that football mm-hmm. strategy? And and is there a tie-in to how you have to invest? Is there anything similar or is it just no, it's it similar. Different? It is similar because it takes it takes a lot. You got to pull the right triggers. You've got to you've got to buy into the right stocks. These guys have to draft right, or at least free agency sign the right guys. And in the case of uh, of, of Saban, you know, obviously he's been a part of this now. This portal that's been around for a couple of years in the in NCAA as well. So he's had to deal with free agency, is what I like to call the portal. So and the NIL with the money and everything else. I mean, it's uh, it's a it's different pros now. They get paid yeah. and they can leave. It's the pros yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you. It's no longer amateurs. But, you know, I, I give all the respect in the world to Nick Saban because you, you've you've got to figure out a way in college uh, to hold on to these guys and not have them get in the portal, lose some of your great players and all the rest of it. And, and he's done a magnificent job of, of doing that. And, and, you know, let's be honest, he's 72 years old. He had to do this later on in his career right. in the last few years. And he's done an amazing job. 
And it's it's actually much tougher than free agency because in football, you know, you get a five year contract. Hey, man, you're 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 there <laughs> until that until that's over. For the most part, every once in a while, somebody's able to get out of it, but not very often. So I I, I total tip of the cap to everything Nick Saban did. I got a quickie for you that you'll like this with Pete Carroll. When I was playing with the Minnesota Vikings, Pete Carroll was the secondary coach. He was the youngest coach in in the NFL at the time. But you guys were on, you were on there together with him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so he was the youngest coach, you know, of in, 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 in football. And then he goes to the Seattle seat. Well, first he goes to USC does extremely well. Then he goes up to Seattle and now he's one of the oldest coaches in football. So I, I guess that makes me older. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it's funny. We talk about Belichick assistants. Actually Belichick had one assistant named Nick Saban, right? Back when they were on the Cleveland Browns together. So that, that, that's one example that is a little different, but, yeah. but none of those Patriots assistants ever did much no. uh, without Brady. I, I like that you mentioned the draft. And before we go, I, I think about that a lot because to me, that really reminds me of investing that to me more than anything, because it's, we have all these assets, which one are we going to pick? And everyone's got a consensus view on, on who's going to do well. And there's all this stuff about, do you trade up? Do you trade down? Is this guy a generational talent? Is this guy going to be a bust? Is he a sure thing? And do we need to tank games because we need to pick third instead of 10th? And, and you realize when you actually look at who's in the NFL, Lamar Jackson was the last pick in the first round, right? Yeah. Dak Prescott, fourth rounder. Brock Purdy, a seventh rounder. Tom Brady, a sixth rounder. And yeah, a lot of these top 10 picks do great. First number one picks, but a lot of them don't do great. Mahomes was a number 10 overall pick, not number one, not top right. five. And, and that's where I see a lot of investment correlation where, yeah, we think these stocks will do well, but a lot of them could turn out to be bust anyway. And there's right. some real under the radar ones that, you could have had for a lot of good value. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. It, it, there is a lot of similarity and it, and it, you can do as much as you want to prepare for everything to give your answers on why this one is the one, right? Whether that's Apple or Tesla or whatever, or in, in the case of this year, uh, you know, some of those top court, Caleb Williams, are you going to go with him? You know, it's so, there is no perfect answer to that, but it is very similar because you can you can add up all the things. I mean, oftentimes when you look at these quarterbacks that because they're mostly quarterbacks, but these quarterbacks that go somewhere in the first round and this team wants this one, but this team wants that one. It's it. There is a lot that goes into that, but there's nothing perfect about it. And the same thing can be said for these stocks. You can you obviously could could have an NVIDIA here and an Intel there. And, and how do you know which one is the one that's going to really make the, the bigger move of the two? And by the way, Intel has done far better this last year than I remember them doing in a long time. They really struggled. And, and I just wondered how long were they going to be able to hold on with the struggles that they had, but they've actually persevered pretty nicely and they had a pretty nice year this last year. But they didn't trade like NVIDIA. They didn't trade like AMD. They didn't trade like Micron and some of these other names. But, uh, you know, it, it is similar because you could get who everybody thinks is the best quarterback in the draft and you could still be wrong. And, and you could do the same thing with stocks. So there is a lot of similarities. And I can tell you this, Eric, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. One of the things that we had at our firm when we had our trading firm on the trading floors in Chicago, the majority of our guys were not from Harvard or Yale, which some of the groups had a lot of that um, and nothing against those schools, but you know, they had, these these ultimate Ivy League guys down there, we wanted people that had experienced failure and winning and all of that. And we so we had a lot of guys that were former athletes that were smart enough to figure it out, but also they had that grit to them that, you know, they've been slapped down, but gotten back up. Right. And and sometimes you, you've got to have that. And I and I think that uh, that was one of the things that helped build our firm even better was the fact that we had different set of people that were smart, but they also played professional hockey, NBA, NFL. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people we had from the Olympics and all sorts of other things, chess clubs, because you know what, that's competitive. It might not sound like it to some people, but the reality is, as long as you're in a competition, you want to win, <laughs> but you don't and, always win. Right. And you don't always, and that's the key, right? Yeah. Is is if you don't always win, you're used to losing and you're used to picking yourself back up. And you wonder, look, having been to one of those kind of colleges that you mentioned myself, it's a lot of people who 
they did great all along the way. Then you get to the workforce, like, wait a minute. I'm not used to losing, right? I'm not used to screwing up, right? I'm I'm like your brother, right? Like I get straight A's all the time and now all of a sudden these trades are going against me. Well, what's going on here? So so I, I do think there's a real key personality uh, analysis that you got to do to yeah. get there, right? But you know, before we go, where can people find you? Because I know you got the YouTube, the social media, the website. Yeah. You're, you're, you're in a lot of places. So where where can we find everything that you're in? Well, Marker Rebellion is our is our company, and MarkerRebellion.com is 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 our website. But we educate people. We 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 offer services that allows them to see what we see in the unusual options world and all of that. And we got a new book out. It's called It's Not an Option. So that's we're excited about that as well. Um, just came out in the last three or four weeks or so, and so far so good. Seems to be going pretty well, and we're excited about that. So they can see us there. John and I do a show Monday through Thursday called The Rebel's Edge which is a lot of fun. It's a, it's a microcosm of what you and I just did because it's extremely fast, but it's like PTI at ESPN over there. You know, pardon the interruption. We do two, two things at the t- very top. We do the macro minute, fantastic futures. We talk about four different stocks. Sometimes they're related to unusual options that we had seen previously, like in the last days or weeks or something like that. And then we just talk two sports topics and it's always kind of fun. And you know, the, the two of us collaborate together. We get it together. And, and the whole thing is maybe 20 minutes. So it's not too long. Gives people an opportunity. And it's one of those things where we might even add on like a like a Rebel's Edge extra to it at some point in time and maybe Over extend time. it out a little bit. <laughs> we, Over time. We get uh, guys like you on there. You know, you we could we could then be questioning you. <laughs> right. yeah, they, they don't shut up. They keep going. Uh, Pete, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for watching this episode. So good to have Pete and Jerry on walking us through what he saw in the markets this past week. If you like this episode, actually click that like button and subscribe and share, comment, engage. The more of those things that you can do, that helps us. It gets the content out there to as many people as possible. And of course, go to Wealthion.com for more information about all of this. And if you're looking for someone to help you figure out your finances, your family's investments, there's a short form at Wealthion.com. You can fill it out. We can connect you with people that we endorse, that we vet, no obligation, no commitment. It's just a free public service that we provide if you're looking to get this sorted out for yourself. Again, Pina Jarin, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Eric Chummy. Thanks for joining us here on Wealthy On. We'll see you next time.